Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. The Apostle refers to the glory that was given to Moses, one of these prophets who waited but didn't have yet the fullness, and what happened in his case. He was inaugurated in such great glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it. In the West, we tend to have miracles of stigmata. If one goes into a Western church, what is the first thing that you see? The cross. If you go into an Eastern church, what is the first thing that you pick up? Light and glory. It's not one against the other, but it's a different emphasis in a sense, and it comes through also in the stories of the saints. As far as I know, the phenomenon, the stigmata is unknown amongst Eastern saints. But ours normally is very much orientated towards victim souls, those who share the passion, like of Padre Pio. All the saints practically have some form of the cross in a big way. In the East, they have this other phenomenon, illumination. But we have it a little bit as well, and I was quite surprised by looking this morning into this phenomenon that quite a few actually have had it. It's obviously the same phenomenon that Moses had. So I just quote a few that have come to my notice this morning. Elizabeth of Hungary. She was the daughter of King Andrew II of Hungary. She was married at the age of 14 to the landgrave of Thuringia, Ludwig IV, who died during the Crusades. Because of problems with his family, this saint was forced out of her castle with her three children and was their sole support. She joined the Third Order of St. Francis and suffered dreadfully the strict directions of her spiritual advisor. Now that's interesting that she gave herself completely to a priest for direction. She nevertheless worked tirelessly among the poor and the sick and advanced rapidly in the spiritual life. Now, in the biography of Count de Montalembert, we have this detail. Now, it happened one day that during the... Now, notice the link with the Eucharist, quite often. During the canon of the Mars, while she prayed fervently, with her hands folded and modestly hidden under her mantle, and her veil raised in order that she might contemplate the sacred host, a celestial light beamed around her. The celebrating priest, a man renowned for a holy life, saw, notice the moment, at the moment of the consecration, the face of the Duchess refulgent with so great a splendour that he was dazzled by it. And until the communion, he found himself surrounded by a light radiating from her as from the sun. Filled with surprise, he returned thanks to God for having thus manifested by a visible and wonderful light the interior brilliancy of that holy soul. And he related afterwards what he had seen. Our own St. Catherine, I say our own because she would have used our monastery and I often used to pray and even celebrate her remarks before her skull in Siena, and I couldn't celebrate with the brethren before leaving. She also was very much oriented towards the Blessed Sacrament, and she would have these strange experiences. 
Blessed Raymond of Capua was her spiritual director and biographer, even though younger than she, he would call her mama. And he writes that he was one morning offering the Holy Mass and turned to give the blessing when he saw that her face had become like an angel's and was sending out bright rays of light. Following this marvel, a strange occurrence took place when the host seemed to rise several inches from the altar onto the pattern that he held in his hand. Blessed Raymond writes, I cannot remember whether it came to rest on the pattern itself or whether I put it there, for what with the brilliance of the Virgin's face and then this second miracle, I was absolutely dumbfounded. Strange things would happen in the realm of the Blessed Sacrament with that saint. One time she wanted to receive and she couldn't go to the chapel and the Lord, while Blessed Raymond was celebrating, took a part of the host from his hand after the fraction and it went through the air and got to her at a distance. And by the way, things do happen in the realm of the Blessed Sacrament. I have more than one picture in my house framed where there's a Eucharistic miracle going on. I have quite a few now collected and it's quite an interesting portion to do with the Blessed Sacrament, the centre of our life. And also things do happen a little bit less dramatically but almost on a daily basis. I had with me a friend who was telling me that she was in church and she came back from Holy Communion. She's always very interiorized and she wouldn't even dream of opening her eyes. But something said to her while she was in Holy Communion at that point, look behind you. So she obeyed and she saw that this gentleman was taking away the Blessed Sacrament. He was putting it in his pocket. And though she wouldn't be that way inclined by nature, she insisted, give it to me, give it to me. And she consumed it immediately. And just this last week, I saw the Lord protecting himself. What had happened was, because I had a little child at Holy Communion, I tipped, I gently tilted so much the pattern to give it by intention, and it was that three hosts actually fell to the kneeler. But the only thing was that I didn't see the third. But then something later on prompted me quite powerfully, go back into the chapel, look there where you haven't looked, and there was a host there. So the Lord protects himself. And I've heard that kind of story, and actually people around here may have had that experience. You may be brought to a church, and you'll actually find a host. The Lord is protecting himself by bringing you there. The best thing to do normally is actually discreetly, without any fuss or bother, consume it. It's the least irreverent thing that can happen at that point, if you're alone and there's no priest around. St. Colette, she would have many experiences when coming close to the Lord. Especially after receiving her communion, she was all enraptured and transfigured, and remained in this state as if she were in a trance. And when she returned to herself, sometimes her face was like an angel's, so beautiful and bright. Just the other day, there was a big celebration in a place I know in Italy for the local saint of that town, Masano del Grappa. And what happened was this, and I've been there, it's very moving, I've stood there. For some reason, her spiritual director had forbidden her to receive communion. She was there at the chapel of the convent that she'd actually founded for the evaluation, the sacramentines. And what happened? An angel, I think her own guardian angel, brought her Holy Communion. And the very spot is marked. And I stood there and thought, wow, just think, this is where the angel came. And that kind of scenario has happened more than actually we think. 
Now, what does that mean? It means that our faith is radically different from anything that has come out of us, for instance, in the Protestant Reformation. It means that we are custodians of the Godhead here on earth. Therefore, how can our life be anything but, as it were, a solar system around the sun of glory, this sun which occasionally beams through this one and that one? Now, it's kind of important because we're losing our centre of gravity and attention, e.g. Now, the simple fact of facing the people when celebrating, although in itself purely physical, is actually also spiritual and leads to this other thing. If you're not careful as a celebrant, mentally you're performing. You're aware of this horizontal dynamic. It's not quite the same, unless you're careful at least. Multiply that by the whole life of the Western Church, and you've got a problem. If the priest in question, and I mean by the level of the whole ethos in the priesthood now, the tendency is that one, were actually even at that point so aware of people that were not free to go into this, as it were, trance mode that the saints had access to far more easily when facing God at the altar. It's like Moses going into this other domain. It's not the same psychologically, I can tell you. And the demon knew it full well, because we have the exorcism that this was actually pushed, pushed, pushed by themselves. It was nowhere put in the council documents, it came in afterwards. And they knew that this was one loophole that they could push, and they were going to take advantage of it. What have we now? Not everywhere at all. It's obviously unequal. But tendentially, that human has invaded the divine in the very house of God. Proof! What happens in many a place before the post communion prayer? The communion itself is made as quick as possible. Woe behold the priest who goes on for more than five minutes at that point. Speed up as many as possible to help so that we can get on to the important thing the church notices. And then there'll be a round of applause. And then there'll be a joke. Or oh, the blessed sacrament is in our hearts. What's gone wrong? Is that this glory that we have? Of course it's there. But what chance has the grace of God to get through to his creatures when man has sat in his throne? Now let's get this straight, my friends. It applies also to every single one here. E.g., the care that we take for the things of God, getting to church in time, not talking to others but to God, getting our act together inside, calming down, and even the way we dress, the way we do our hair and shave, it all adds one little bit to the honour and glory physically given to our King, who is physically present in our midst. It does matter. Shoddiness in the house of God. Let's give him the best of what we have, even physically. I conclude, my friends. The Lord is, in a sense, this poor robber, beaten and left, but this time in his own church. The priest and the Levite passed him by. Now, I've noticed that the lay people, that sleeping giant, they're the ones who are waking up. Listen to the Holy Ghost. You are also church and you have the sense of the faithful. Jesus is on the ground, hurting in his own house. Pour on him the oil and wine of your love expressed physically.